this an activator or a deactivator? Activator. It's an activator. And why is that? Because it's electron donating. By? Resonance. How about by induction? Withdrawing. That's right. But usually resonance beats induction. So by resonance, this is electron donating. How would we show that this is electron donating? Well, we could show it like this. We could show how the lone pair can put a negative charge on carbons inside the benzene. How about this nitrogen? Electron donating or withdrawing? Withdrawing. Now, overall, this is still donating. Overall, this is still donating because... Wouldn't it also tend to go to the more... Um... More electronegative atom? Yeah. That's right. Okay, that's right. It turns out, though, that that only moderates and does not completely cancel the first effect. Okay, so the point that we have to learn here is this is what we could call, so is this an activator or a deactivator? Because it's electron donating. This is what we would call a strong activator because the nitrogen has nothing to do with its lone pair except donate it to the benzene by resonance. This is what we would call a moderate activator. This is a moderate activator. There is a resonance structure where the nitrogen can donate its lone pair to the benzene, but there's also a resonance structure where the nitrogen can donate its lone pair in the direction of the oxygen. So this is still an activator, but it's only a moderate activator. So here's a little taxonomy of all the different types of activators. These two are very strong activators. And OH or NH2 groups are very strong activators because they have nothing to do with their lone pair but donated by resonance. However, if there's another direction that you can donate your lone pair away from the benzene, that makes you into only a moderate activator. That's what we have down here. And we've also seen that alkyl groups are activators, but they're only weak activators. They only have that hyperconjugation effect for donating electrons. These all are activators, but there's a hierarchy of some that are stronger than others. We talked a little bit about the hierarchy for deactivators. We talked about what's the strongest type of deactivators, well, especially nitro groups. Um, what's the weakest type of deactivators? CL and halogens. Halogens, that's right. Halogens are the weakest deactivators. And then every, most of the other things fall into kind of the moderate deactivators. Well, here's the hierarchy for uh, activators. Incidentally, what, what type of functional group is this? Amine, and how about this? Amide. A amide. So the point is that we have made this less electron donating by turning it into an amide. That's actually, have, have you guys started the um, amino acid and peptide part of the course yet? Yes. One of the very, very, I'm sorry? And we're very confused on that. Ah, okay. Well, uh, hopefully the videos that I have up might help you a little bit there. But one of the most important things there is amides, because peptides are held together by amide bonds. And the key thing is that amide nitrogens don't behave like amine nitrogens. And the reason is this extra resonance structure. Amine nitrogens, um, they are very eager to donate their lone pair. But amide nitrogens are not that eager to donate their lone pair because they're already busy donating it into this resonance structure over here. So this will also be an important idea when we talk about um, amino acids and peptides pretty soon. Anyway, the point here is it's useful to be able to go back and forth between these. If you want a really strong activator, this is the way to go. But if you want to moderate your activation, this is the way to go. So if you only want to add, say, if you want to add many substituents, maybe you want an amine. But if you only want to add one substituent and not over put in too many substituents, then you want to moderate its uh, abilities there. So how do we go back and forth uh, between these? Let's see. Does that go forward or reverse? First of all, how can we put this acyl group on the nitrogen? This is actually a reaction we pretty much already learned. Oh, with a carboxylic acid. Good. Um, so you're thinking about a kind of a nucleophilic substitution reaction. That would probably work. 
However, carboxylic acids are not that reactive, and there might be acid-base yeah, reactions. CL. Pardon? With CL. That's right. We want the most reactive carboxylic acid derivative we can use. Well, we know that the most reactive carboxylic acids are the acyl halides. So if we really want to um, put this acyl group on, the way to get this to work the best is with this reaction. Uh, now, we, if we want to use pyridine here. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about why that is um, right now. So remember, the first step is going to look like this. Now we reform the carbonyl. We've talked about how we want to attack the carbonyl and reform the carbonyl when we attack when we attack carboxylic acid derivatives. Um, are we supposed to use equilibrium arrows for this? This reaction? Uh, let's see. Well, uh, let's talk about that in a second. Now what? Now you're going to do the CL minus is going to steal an H. Yeah, we don't want to leave this with a positive charge. So this is just one more example of the addition elimination reaction where we have a nucleophilic attack on a carboxylic acid uh, derivative. Now, what, what type of functional group have we created here? An amide. So would we expect this reaction to be reversible? Well, no, because we're definitely moving down the reactivity chart. We're going from the acyl halide at the top to an amide at the bottom. So we would not want to use equilibrium arrows here. Um, it's not, there's no easy way to go from an amide back to an acyl halide here. So we would not want to think of this as reversible. There's going to be a way to get this off, but it's not because this is a, not because the forward reaction is reversible. Now, one difficulty here is notice that this reaction produced as a byproduct hydrochloric acid. As a byproduct, we produced hydrochloric acid, but we probably don't want to be accumulating a bunch of strong acid in our reaction materials. That's going to mess up any further reactions we want. That's the purpose of the pyridine here. Pyridine is a base. We're just adding some extra base just to soak up this acid and neutralize the acid that's being produced. So that's a minor technicality, but that's something that you might be expected to put in your reagents. So could it be any strong base, or does it have to be pyridine? Usually people use pyridine. And this actually is not a strong base. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's not like uh, hydroxide, but it's strong enough to mop up this hydrochloric acid over here. Uh, I'm sure other weak bases would work too, but the standard base to use here is pyridine. So the Cl minus would still take in the pyridine, or could the pyridine take the H? Uh, let's see. Um, you could show the, uh, like this, and then you can show the pyridine reacting with the HCl. I don't know if you'd be expected to go oh, through anymore. I about the H. Uh, yeah, you might show the pyridine taking this proton here. Yeah, that would be a nice shortcut. But so. then in the end, wouldn't it still give it the Cl minus? Because in the end, if you did that, the pyridine would be positively charged and the Cl would be negatively charged? Let's see. I don't think so um, because, remember, this is a strong acid. This no, doesn't you like you wouldn't have the H on the Cl, so it wouldn't be a strong acid. That's true, but this is a very weak base because this is a very strong acid. Chloride doesn't really mind having a negative charge very much because it's electronegative and big. It doesn't mind having a negative charge. In fact, this is hardly basic at all. Um, that's the whole reason why this is a strong acid because chloride, negative chloride, is pretty happy. So it so, doesn't matter if you have an ionic bond between pyridine and positively charged pyridine and Cl minus, or that's the way. That would be the best way to write it. Yeah. I'm sorry. You were saying. It, so it doesn't matter if you produce HCl or positive pyridine and negative CL? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's usually written something like this to show that the pyridine is protonated and then the chloride is the, uh, the counter ion to that. So yeah, we, we normally think of the proton being on the pyridine and the chloride is just the counter ion to that. Okay, so you don't get HCl. Actually. That's right. That's the whole point, again, of putting in the pyridine uh -huh. to prevent the HCl from accumulating. We don't want to accumulate that strong acid because that could mess up uh, other reactions we were trying to do. Those are all just technicalities. Um, but uh, anytime you have a reaction that's producing uh, hydrochloric, you might uh, be standard to put in a base like pyridine to soak that up.
So this reaction should make good sense, this way of turning the amine into a amide. Is that something we've already seen for carboxylic acid derivatives? 